Hello, everybody. Welcome to Rock, Paper, Hand Grenades. I'm Matt Connerton, and to my right is nobody because Gary is not here. He's got that uh, stomach flu that's going around, but uh, we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get through it without him, I guess. I've had to do it before. <laughs> that guy, I'll tell you. I'm just kidding. No, uh, Gary, if you're watching, I hope you feel better soon. I'm sure you will. Um, stomach flu typically only lasts like a day or two anyway, so that's the one, that's the one good thing about having that particular ailment. Usually is pretty quick. But we have a great guest with us returning to the show, Frank Edelblue, who is running for governor, representative Frank Edelblue. So you're the honorable. I guess. Well, Frank Edelblue. Hopefully. You've been on. <laughs> I try to be, right? You've been on with us twice, as I believe, right? I once once by yourself and once with Hal Shirtliff. I remember the Hal Shirtliff. I think everyone who's a regular viewer remembers that, the Hal Shirtliff. That was, that was interesting. <laughs> A little um, bit of a food fight. Maybe that's what the you know the Republican debates they modeled it after that. Yeah. I, well, yeah. Well, you guys. Yeah, it got a little bit more more with Hal. Like yeah, you, I was talking a lot. I remember you. You kept it pretty cool, but Hal was was very animated. Yeah. And uh, you know, I like Hal. We actually carry. He does a show called Camp Constitution, which we carry on uh, IPM Nation on uh, Saturdays, can, and it's. You mean he teaches people about the Constitution? Are we going to argue about that? That seems like a good thing. <laughs> no, but well, we can. I mean, I don't know. We're, we're going to talk about all kinds of stuff. But yeah. uh, but I remember that show. It was, and people can find it. Of course, we archive all the shows on YouTube. Um, but uh, you guys were arguing about the article. We were talking about Article Five at Article the time. Article Five Convention. Yeah, yes. yeah. And you were you were in favor of doing that, and he was opposed to it, if I remember correctly. Right. You know what's interesting to me, and I might have said this that night on the show, is. Um, I, I, I would tend to agree with you on that issue because to me it's like, well, if it's, if it's an article of the Constitution that says you can do this, then why oppose it? Because if you oppose it, then it's like you're trying to protect the Constitution from itself. A little bit. But, I mean, the, the thing with that whole issue really is most of the folks who are interested in that are just concerned about the overreach of the federal government. Right. And we're all basically like, what can we possibly do to try and rein in the right. overreach of the federal government? That being one of many options that are on the table in terms of trying to figure out how to do that. Right. Because uh, Hal seemed to – seemed like the key to his objection is that all kinds of crazy things are going to happen once you open that Pandora's box. But the process makes it so that – well, most likely, absolutely nothing's ever going to happen because it's so hard to to make any of that change happen. That's probably the case is that nothing is going to happen right. because it's so hard to even get to that point. Right, you know? right. But again, but Helen and I do share the idea of trying to figure out how to rein in the federal government, and I think that's the main yeah the main thrust of trying to figure it out. Yeah, I mean, it's not like you're you're that different ideologically, just on that particular issue. Um, it, it's tactics at it that was, point in time. Right, exactly, exactly. So you are running for governor, and you are. Um, how many terms have you been in the first term house? Okay. First term representative. Wow. Um, why is that a well? Ads is just, uh, oh, hey, Johnny is here. Did you want to join us, Johnny? Or sure, I'm there. Yeah, you can, you can actually uh, Come sit, on in, Johnny. sit in Gary's seat if you want. <laughs> you can, you can be Gary. Uh, this is Johnny, our producer. I've, I've never met Johnny, how are you? Pleasure John, to meet you. Johnny be good. Johnny is his good. name. So. Chuck Berry's on. Is that true? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It Johnny is good. I actually uh, legally changed it for six months so I could have a little license. Oh, good for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore, but, you know, but I did it for a little while. <laughs> for six months, it was. Go for it. <laughs> That's um, funny. No, the reason I said wow is there seems to be, uh, it, it, like, I look at the, the Republican candidates and, you know, Rubio's out now, mm -hmm. but, um, and then there's uh, Ted Cruz, Trump, for, for Cruz, Kasich, and right. Still. But you look at these; it, it seems like there's a trend of of people jumping into races very early in their political careers. So you're in your first term in the House, so you're still. I mean, did you hold office prior to that? It seems like you're pretty young in your political career. I am fairly young in my political career, but I'm not young in my career of running organizations. Okay. I mean, so we've never talked about my background. I mean, so right, right. I yeah. mean, I'm like I'm a finance accounting guy. I started my career at a company called Price Waterhouse Coopers. Anybody know those guys? I know Price Waterhouse. PwC, yeah, Price Water. Well, they've okay, they've merged. Yeah. You know, we used to have the Big Eight. Now we're down to the Big Four. Okay. So Price Waterhouse and Coopers and Labyrinth merge as Price Waterhouse Coopers these days. Okay. 
Um, so I started my career there. I left. I was the CFO for a company, uh, for a public company for a brief period of time, and then I started a business. Yeah. Um, and I, it was a great business. You know, classic story, started at your dining room table. When my wife got tired of not being able to serve dinner, she kicked me off the table, and I, <laughs> so I needed a place to work. So I took one of my kids, I moved him out of their bedroom and moved him in to share with their sibling, and I moved into the bedroom as my office. How'd that go over with the kids? Uh, well, the, at the time, actually, that was the baby's room, so they couldn't oh, complain okay. all that much, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, right. Good time so it worked out it. okay. Yeah. Um, but in 2009, I ended up, finishing up a sale of that business to a French company called Altran. But at the time we had over 800 employees. We wow. were operating in over 20 countries. So I've run large, complex, you know, organizations. And, and the work of our, that I did at that company was for Fortune 2000 companies. Mm -hmm. You know, again, large, complex organizations, companies yeah. that, um, you know, the budgets for these companies were far larger than the state budget. Yeah. You know, the numbers just had many more zeros. Right, um, right. You know, so so I'm not a stranger to that kind of thing. And then I still work in, you know, finance and investing. I do angel investing, mostly in technology startup companies. Yeah. Uh, mobile platform type stuff. Where were you last stuff. year? Where was I last <laughs> year? <laughs> Could have used that. Did you need one of those? <laughs> we started up a small uh, a small online thing for energy services. Okay. Here, so we're just gonna there's a whole bunch sure of things that we could have used. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, starting it out of pocket, starting it up all by yourself, no backing, no nothing. Been there, done that. That, you yeah, know, it's not easy. Right, because I, I was I self funded month. my company and Same here. Uh, yeah, and it's just people think it's so, such a this glorious existence. Oh, yeah. <laughs> really, what it means no. is that you're the first to get there in the morning, you're the last to leave at night. If there's and no money the left at the end of the month, you don't get paid. Right, exactly, because exactly, you got to pay yeah. everybody. You're the last guy to get paid. Yeah, um, yeah. it just sounds really you know. It sounds like it's going to be a great everything. thing and it's going to be a lot of fun, but it, it's a lot more work than yeah. You know, it, when you're a kid, you think, oh well, come on, I can do this. But as you get older, it definitely realize once you start it yeah it's there's worth just so it, many things you don't you don't yeah. realize that go into starting to a running a business yeah. yeah so so i really think of myself so then after i left there i've been doing uh, i initially when i was doing um early stage investing like angel investing i joined a group in boston called common angels I don't know if you know those guys, if you ever talked to them. No. Um, but then in 2013, I left there and I ran for the state house. Mm -hmm. And so I'm serving in the state house. So I'm still doing the angel investing, but more on my own with the, the group of guys that I met, you know, through working with Common Angels. Yeah. Um, so I sort of feel like, you know, I kind of am the outside business guy who's right. running for office. Although the advantage that I have is that I have been inside long enough to see how to fix it and how to make it work for the people of New Hampshire, yeah. but not so long that I've become the problem. Right. I, I feel like so your your pitch kind of is it sounds like so you've got executive experience right. running a business and having run a business, you know, you understand the financials of things. So it's kind of a two tiered kind of. But there's an advantage even one step further. So I'm not just the business guy because I have served in the, have house. in the house. Yeah. So like I recognize that not everything translates from business to government. You have yeah. to get things done differently. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's very much a consensus business uh, over there in the state house, you right. know, in government. Um, so you can't just be the CEO and just says like, I said it, therefore you have to do it. You work with people, you persuade them in terms of your ideas and you Especially bring them along. Yeah. 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 And so, but I think that's a beautiful part of the legislative process. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not against that. But I have that advantage, so I'm not right. walking into this executive position saying like, okay, when I say do this, when I say jump, how high? You know, because right. people are just gonna like laugh when they see you. Like, what? What right, do you right. say? Um, yeah. So again, just I think that's an advantage that I have. Yeah, yeah, no, it sounds like it. Um, have you always kind of has that always been in the back of your mind that you'd no, like to not run at for all. governor? Or? I never imagined I would even run in the state house. Honestly, I've never really? imagined yeah. myself getting into politics. Yeah. So what uh, what caused it? What I made mean, you get in? So honestly, when I was running my company. You know, I just had my head down. I am just working as hard as I can, as we talked about, you know, and yeah. hopefully I didn't even know about politics, right? Because that meant my, they weren't <laughs> getting in the way of my business that I'm trying to do. That, that you know of. That I know in, of, in right. In the moment, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then, you know, once I sold it, I, you know, I had the ability to catch my breath and I looked around and I said, wow, things have really changed, you know? Yeah. Uh, and we need to leave, like I just felt bad. I mean, I had it good when I started my company and growing up and everything else. Yeah. And I said, we can't hand this thing over to the next generation looking like it is. So mm -hmm. I'm like, you know what? So not only did I think it needed to be fixed, but I was in a position where I could fix it. You're like, right. I don't have to run for governor. And, right. and honestly, I have to tell you, well, let me, let me just finish that thought. So, um, you know, so I, I said, like, I got to do something to try and fix, fix this because I, because I can. I got to basically man up and try and do something since I can. Yeah. Um, but it, honestly, the run for governor, I would say it's not even, it's not about me per se. 
it is about the future of the state and the trajectory that we're on makes me feel uncomfortable. We're, you know, at this rate, I think we're going to become a backwater of Boston fairly quickly. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And I just think we need to change the way we're doing things. We look at business as if it's the bad guy. You know, like businesses are bad, not realize no businesses create jobs and people right. like jobs, you know, in right. fact, more jobs are better. And, uh, you know, and as a state, we've kind of left um, some constituents behind. So I sort of feel like I'm in this car or they leave us or they leave. Well, young but here's, people graduate and they take off. Well, let's talk lack about of that. Opportunity, yeah. Lack of exactly. Yep. It's the lack of opportunity. Yeah. That's what's going on. So we're like we're this, uh, you know, Toyota Corolla. And uh, you step, well, I don't like that analogy, but we're a car. It's a great car. I have one. Oh, you I do. have one? Okay, good. I do too. So you're <laughs> yeah. reluctant to sell the so thing. So you <laughs> step Still on the accelerator. It keeps it. going. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it just won't stop. You step on the accelerator, though, and it's just not performing. So we're like this car that's this firing on two cylinders. Yeah. Yep. You know, and it's firing on two cylinders because we left two cylinders behind, which is one is the young people, mm -hmm. you know, because we've not created opportunities for them in the state. Yeah. And the other reason is that we've left behind what I'll call, you know, kind of older folks for lack of a better term, but there's a lot of people in the state like 50, 55, 60, 65 years old. They're looking at working for another 10 or 20 years. Yeah. They may even have a college degree. In this last recession, they had their legs cut out from underneath them. They have not landed well. No. And so these people are underperforming. So really between these two constituencies, as a state, we're not performing. You know, yeah. we are underperforming. And so I really think that we have so much more potential but still, what happens is, um, you know, the, the, the people who have been occupying the corner office are functioning. They're like, they're managers in a business. Well, like Maggie Hassan, she has no, one of the knocks I, on her that I always hear is she doesn't really have any business experience, does she? I mean, where did she, I don't know that much about her. Yeah, I know I that I think I she's. Really, a, yeah, I don't think yeah, she's a, a really business mean. person per se. She, yeah. she had some. She's a, a lawyer, I believe. Okay, know, which yeah. is always skeptic. Which, I'm skeptical. Well, and we have plenty yeah. of those in politics, certainly. Yeah. But so, <laughs> but what happens is, so these guys in the corner office, they function kind of like managers or custodians, yeah. just kind of like, yep. can I tread water? Mm -hmm. The problem is, like, the world's moving on, guys. Right. So, like, we're <laughs> sitting. They're sitting here saying, "Look at that! I kept everything the same." I'm like, "Well, wait a second. <laughs> you know, like, we got to go forward into the 21st century, yeah, here, yeah. guys." So, yeah. I just think that there's a lot of opportunities to move into the 21st century embrace new technologies and new opportunities exactly. and not the problem is like like too often in politics like so i guess this is the curse of the entrepreneur whenever there's like change and dislocation and stuff like that you're like oh i can do something with that i can make that work right. for me as opposed to now everybody there's these change like we have an aging population you're like Oh no! What are we gonna do? How are we gonna make it younger? Like, what do you got? Fairy dust? You can sprinkle on people? Like, <laughs> you know, as opposed to saying, like, no, that's our reality. Let's yeah. make it work for us. Right. So. Right. Yeah. You you said something interesting there about you know it's like they get in there and it's like uh, how do I keep it the same? You know, and it, it, almost like you know I just I gotta. I think there's a lot of obviously a lot of careerism in politics where people get into office and then it, it becomes about, you know, how do I how do I keep it the same? How do I keep this from completely crumbling so I can then run for for something else, you know, like Hassan now, she's going to run for right. for the Senate, and uh, you know. Well, so I mean, I'm not I'm not going to run to become a, the governor for the next thirty years. Yeah. Right. But what I am going to do is, I think we need a certain kind of, you know, I use the term leadership, you know, like entrepreneurial leadership to kind of put us on a different trajectory. Mm -hmm. You know, we need an inflection point to move us in a different direction, get that thing moving along, and then I'm ready to hand off this baton to the next guy who can like continue this thing going. Yeah. But I kind of have this vision for how we can shift and move into the 21st century and make it work for the people in New Hampshire. Yeah. We, we, we're a small state, right? We're ridiculously small. 1.3 million people. You know what I say? We should be able to have like an all hands on deck meeting for everyone in the state on a monthly I mean, basis. Okay, everybody could. call in. Here's what we're going to do in order to, su to succeed. Like we should be, we should be nimble. We should be moving and taking advantage of opportunities. Whereas these other big states, they should be like lethargic and slow. Instead, right. we're just like, oh no, I don't know what we're gonna do. We can't right. move. You know? I mean, you look so. at the size. I went to Texas a couple years back, yeah. and the, just the, you don't realize the sheer size of that state exactly. until you're there, and you're like, you know, we say small world, and we mean it. I mean, yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> my ex's daughters go to my mother's daycare. Like, that's how small a world we live in right. in New Hampshire. Right. There's a Texas, connect point. Oh, and I tell yeah. people that, and they're like, how does that even happen? And right. I'm like, I, don't, yeah. I think you underestimate how small it is. Actually, here. you want to yeah. know a, a good story like along those lines? Yeah. I don't, want, I don't know where you guys want to go with the show, but no, here's we, a, keep, we keep it loose. Keep yeah. loose? Okay. So, <laughs> I, like I should, so one of these cards, I don't know if you want to hold that card up. So these are, oh, I yeah. call these, these are like little URL cards. Yeah. So during the presidential primary, 
I was the opening act for these guys. So what I would do is I would show up an hour before the main, sh the main act, the presidential candidate showed up, yeah. and I would literally introduce myself to the people who were coming in. I mean, all these New Hampshire voters are coming in. Right. I would hand out these cards. I handed out over 7,000 of those cards, shook you know, wow. 10,000 hands. But here's an example. I, I got two stories. I'll share one with you. If you want another one, I'll let you know this. So my mom lives up in Maine. And she has, she has a pro plumbing problem. So she calls the plumber, the plumber comes to her house and he fixes her problem and he's getting ready to fill out the bill and say, like, tell me your name and stuff like that. And the guy all of a sudden he's looking at the name and he says, wow, that's a really unusual name. He's like, you know, my wife was in New Hampshire the other day at a presidential <laughs> primary thing and met a guy who's running for governor in New Hampshire who's got that same name. Uh, and my mom's like, hey, that's my son. That's yeah. funny. Yeah. It is a small it's, world. It's yeah. a small, yeah. you're talking yeah. about a small world. Yeah. You're just like, this is incredible. So, yeah. What's yeah. the other story? Well, the, another <laughs> one is down in New Jersey. So yeah. uh, my sister goes out to dinner with her friend. Now, my sister's married, so she has a different um, you know, last name. Yeah. And uh, so she's out with these people and they're talking and all, and they're sharing like, oh, we went up to New Hampshire because we wanted to go see the presidential candidates and stuff like that. And we met this guy who was running for governor and he gave us this card. They had a card. And uh, my sister goes, that's my brother. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So, no I mean, kidding. again, such a small world oh, yeah, and you absolutely. get these kind of ubiquitous types of connect points. That's amazing. Or right? maybe you're just famous and you don't know it. <laughs> no, definitely not famous. You know? So you're a Republican. What kind of Republican are you? So I think of myself as a practical conservative. Yeah. You know, and so what that means is, um, you know, so I know I'm a principled. I know where I know what the things I believe in and I vote on them. And anybody who wants to know how I think about things, I got a voting record. You can go check it out. Yeah. But when I was in business, I used to say, if I can get 51 percent of the decisions right on a day, mm -hmm. that's a good day. Right. 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 Because then that means I'm moving in my direction. Right. And so I kind of am a legislator in the same vein in the sense that, um, you know, I don't I mean, I maybe I'm idealistic and I know where I want to go, but I don't have to get everything all at once. I'm happy to work with people and try and just move the ball in that direction. And I think that that's the approach that I would take to governing as well. Yeah. You know, my goal is not to go to to um, Concord and burn the place down. My goal is, you know, I think that there's a direction we need to go, but this ship is not going to turn on a dime. You know, we need yeah. to slowly shift things and move in a direction. And that's where I talk about, like, let's set the tone for how do we get there and let's have like a 20 year, 20 year trajectory to recover some of what we've lost kind of thing. So. Yeah. Well, plus we don't elect arsonists typically. So if you burn the place That down, would be a problem, that wouldn't would be it? A problem, yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know? But I mean, I think we need to just, you need to have that 51%. Like, let's just keep every day you wake up and forward, you move the ball a little bit more forward. forward. forward positive forward momentum. Yep. Yeah, and as yep. an entrepreneur, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because yeah. exactly. otherwise, there's good days and bad days. As long as you had a little oh, yeah. bit more good than bad, then that was a good day. Yeah, so. yeah. exactly. Absolutely. Um, we were talking before the show. Uh, Norm cornered you and asked about an issue near and dear to his heart. Um, uh, marijuana or ca cannabis, and you you voted for. Um, I have. We actually last week we had a decriminalization bill that came again. before the house, and again, again. exactly. Yeah. I think we've haven't we? Is it like you might know better than me? I think ten since two thousand ten times ten we've now times. voted wow. for this. I didn't ten know it was that much. Times. From what I read the other day, ten times. Yeah, we just wow. keep passing and this, and then either it gets stuck in the Senate or it gets vetoed by somebody. So. Yeah. Exactly. I, I think that you know, but it's not. Um, you know, it's not that I'm advocating that, you know, everybody go out and smoke cannabis or something like that. Well, but what but I'm saying is I just feel purposes. like for medicinal purposes, we've already passed that. It's, it's wrong it's so that we haven't. it's so strict. We, it's wrong. Yeah. That, but even in the strictest, we haven't got it implemented. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the exactly. first woman got her card finally and she died before she could even get. It was you know, difficult. That's a heartbreaking As someone story. with cancer, it's like they really, tell me flat out, you can't get it because you're not terminal. And I'm like, so, but you want to give me chemotherapy or radiation and make right. me sick and make me. But. Yeah, I really think we need to get that implemented, and I think that you know we'd have to make that as, as a serious priority. Oh, absolutely, to get done. Yeah, so, yeah. But I mean, again, I'm already trying to move that agenda forward. The yeah. other thing, I kind of a, kind of an approach that I have running for governor, is that you know how most politicians, you come along and say like, well, like if you guys elect me, then I'm going to do this. And I just think that's a lousy way to do it. How about if I just do things, and if you like where I'm going, come along. Do you know yeah. what I'm saying? So I just yeah. have engaged myself. There's like various projects. I mean, I can't do everything at once, but right. you know, as an individual person, I'm just I'm trying to work on things and move the ball forward in a lot of areas. And <clears throat> I think that that helps people see like, oh, this is where this guy's going. Like, there, it's not going to be a secret. It's not going to be a mystery. Like, yeah. gee, I hope he does what he says he's going to do. <laughs> no, no, I'm voting for things. I'm working on projects. So you know, it's important to me. So yeah. yeah. So what do we do about the uh, business climate in the state improving it? I, you know, I didn't realize, and I'm an entrepreneur as well, and I, I didn't you. realize, though, mm -hmm. until I started doing this show that, for example, 
Um, I've never made enough to have to pay it, but the business enterprise, enterprise tax that we have. And, and the other ways where I had always thought that New Hampshire was a more business friendly state than in fact I now understand it to be. Yeah, yeah it, it is, it's sort of sad. Like when um, we used to refer to the New Hampshire advantage. Right. And some people still know what that is, but I really think it has to go into the, the archives of, of mythology at this point <laughs> in time. You know what I'm saying? In other words, because a lot of those things that were advantage, and we still have some, we definitely but, we've, have lost, some. but yeah. we've lost a lot of it. I mean, in the classic example is our business income tax. In the 70s, we had no business income tax. Yeah. Today, we have the highest business income tax in New England. Wow. Like, go figure, right? And yeah. we fought tooth and nail last session to get a quarter of a percentage of a point reduction. You're just like, seriously, it was that hard? So, yeah. you know, when we talk about the New Hampshire Advantage being like, yes, this is where you'd want to be for your business because we have no business income tax, that's just a myth. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is true that our other tax structures are, you know, other than our property tax, we don't have an income tax, we don't have a sales tax. Yeah. Uh, energy costs are outrageous in this state, and it's... You know, I, you know, I've been working actually on this legislatively. I wish that I had fairy dust to fix this problem because this is a tough problem to fix because we've made some really serious mistakes in the past and we're still paying for those. And these are not like uh, mistakes that you can just like, you know, use the fairy dust to make them go away. These are like, have a long tail, like 30 year tails on how yeah. do you work out of the Seabrook restructuring. Mm -hmm. You know, the bow plant restructuring, we got like, messed. Yeah, four hundred fifty million dollars of you know stranded costs. Like we gotta yeah. pay this thing off. Like how are we gonna do that? Uh, and you can't. You, again, it just doesn't go away. These are long term yeah. things that we have to fix. But we we absolutely need to get that that you know we need to work on it and fix it. So long term, again, we can fix that problem in our state because you know manufacturing companies um, you know they have a choice. They can move. And, uh, and we yeah. don't want them to leave the state because once they yeah. leave, it's not like they're going to wake up one morning because we've solved the problem and say like, oh, oh well, well, I check guess that I'll out. spend uh, the same money and go and just all like the way pick back. up from Georgia <laughs> and move right. all the way back to New Hampshire yeah, just because no. I want to. Right? These we these we create inflection points and companies need to, um, you know, we we want to create the inflection points that pe cause people to come here. Actually, there's a really important inflection point going on right now. Um, I feel like I should. Set, all these arson examples. I feel like I should uh, <laughs> set somebody's pants on fire on this one. But I mean, uh, so the company Bombardier, familiar with those guys? No, Up in I'm Montreal. Not. They make Why all kinds, big name? industrial company. Okay. You, you might know them from snowmobiles, but they yeah. also make, you know, subway train cars. Yep. And so they've gotten an $11.5 billion contract to manufacture, or several contracts actually, to manufacture train cars for New York and San Francisco. The 1987 Build America Act requires that the 87% uh, of the content of those trains be manufactured in the U.S. Okay. So what Bombardier has done is they've released their list of subcontractors, and they told the subcontractors, you guys better go get set up on the U.S. side of the border because we need U.S. content. Right. So, you know, their subcontractors could set up on our side of the border, and then they could sell those parts into Montreal, and then they get the U.S. content, you know, aspect <laughs> of it. Right. We should be, you know every day knocking on doors in Montreal to say New Hampshire is the place where you want to be because I guarantee New York wants them, Vermont wants them, yeah. and Maine wants yeah. them, but we want these companies in New Hampshire. Yeah. So, and this is one of these inflection points. You know, if a company decides to locate in Littleton or St. Johnsbury, that's where they're located. Mm -hmm. And, they're, you know, to your point, they're not going to wake up one morning in, in uh, Littleton and say, like, you know what, I think I'm going to move the company over to St. Johnsbury. Right. It's just yeah, not going to happen. So we have to get these guys as much as we can. <coughs> we need to bring these companies in and locate them and get them set up here in New Hampshire because we will have a long tail of advantage right. uh, having brought them in. So, And, and yeah. quite frankly, you know, the New Yorks, the Vermonts, and the Maines, don't have an advantage in the area of utilities over us because of you know the same rate structure applies to them for the most part so what about in terms of regulation how bad is that in new hampshire i mean we hear all the time about federal regulations which choke everybody but yeah are, are we over regulated in the state in, in a number of different ways and, and one of the areas that i that i you know have in my sights is probably the way that we license everything you know, like mm. you want to be a, uh, a hairdresser, you got to get a license. You got all different kinds of things. And, and we continue to, to see these licenses go up. I mean, I was talking to someone today about a new license for, uh, you know, septic inspectors. Yeah. Um, and those, what happens is, what we don't realize is that you, they become kind of like a guild, you know, oh, that yeah. prevents other people from joining the yep. club. Right. You know, we voted yes. on a bill the other day for a mold inspection license, yep. you know, certified mold <laughs> inspectors. My dad is an electrician and he was like, you, don't understand. I had to go out of state to get all of my training and everything no because it was that bad. He was like, the 
Yeah, so we make it very difficult. The stuff that I took here, they wouldn't accept. They were like, nope, these aren't good enough. Is that right on the electrical side, on the electrician side? Wow. So what we don't want to do is we don't want to create a situation that prevents people from opening up a business. Um, You know, and we want to allow people to have the freedom to hire people that they want to do the jobs that they want. And the thing is, it's a bit of a myth. Now, maybe on the electrician side, it might be a little bit different. But in some of these other aspects, you know, simply because they're certified doesn't necessarily make them good at what they do. Right. (laughs) You know what I mean? So you have this false sense of security. It's kind of like going through TSA. You're like, oh, they're going to catch all the bad guys. And then you see the reports and you realize that most of the bad guys get through and they're just really harassment, you know? So you have this false sense of security that we want to um, try and... You know, not perpetrate on everyone. Yeah, one of the you know, I we were talking before the show. I'm an independent. I, I was a Democrat up until I'm actually registered as a Democrat currently, just for ballot access reasons. Of well, because for I the primary for just took place, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. I voted for Vermin Supreme and was very proud to do so. In the, the boot guy. Democratic primary. He came in. <laughs> hey, he came in fourth. But uh, <laughs> there were only four. Odin did not place. Uh, well, yeah, but still, it sounds good, right? It does sound good. Yeah, he came in fourth. Um, okay, but uh, so <laughs> I, geez, I could have written myself and I can probably come in fifth, but um. But one of the things that drove me out of the Democratic Party was just the it's like they they want to regulate everything. They want to tax everything. They want that tax revenue because they want to spend a lot of money. But there's kind of a contravening principles here. On the one hand, they want to get as much tax money as they can to spend as much as they can, while at the same time making it so difficult for businesses to generate that revenue. They right. just make it so, and it's something you learn when you become an entrepreneur, if you don't know it already, I didn't know it already, becoming an entrepreneur and kind of realizing, well, wait a minute, they make it so hard yep. to make that To money. make the money, and then they want it when you get it. Right, right. They do everything they can. And locally here in Manchester, I hear it constantly, oh, yeah. how hostile this city is to new business. Really? Or yeah. even existing business. They chase people out, restaurants that... So you, you know, and, but that's one of the things I think about is like, so, you know, my platform is about jobs and jobs is, you know, bipartisan because yeah. everybody likes jobs and needs jobs. Yeah. Um, you know, so I often say, you know, like, you know, people are like, well, who are you running against? I'm not running against anybody. I'm running for the people in New Hampshire because it's really, I mean, that's my focus. That's what yeah. I got to concentrate yeah. on is to try and move an agenda forward for the people of New Hampshire. And that doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or an independent or Republican everybody benefits from a good job. Right. I sometimes say, you know, uh, you're up there at the state house and we're doing our work, you know, spend half of our time how to figure out how to get, you know, his money to him because he needs money, you know, as opposed to if he had a job and it was able to pay his bills and he wouldn't even yep. need that stuff anyway. So we wouldn't right. even have to have this argument. Right. So, yeah. You know, yeah. It's just, and you know, if, if you're in business as well, you know that like growth you know, and a good business, like when you're doing really well, I mean, it just covers over all your mistakes, doesn't it? Yeah. Like, you know, you're making the mistakes, but you're, hey, you're growing out of them, you know? Yeah, yeah a little exactly. bit of success can cover a lot of mistakes. Can't yep. it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? Definitely like, can. Nothing like winning that big contract, exactly. <laughs> right, you know? right, exactly. Exactly. Now, what about on social issues? Uh, you know, we talked about um, uh, the cannabis. Do you support full legalization, by the way, or only so uh, the, the, I would support full legalization. The only thing we need is we need to help law enforcement because we don't have a roadside test yet. I think it's just a matter of time before technology catches up to that, mm-hmm. you know, um, for impairment. And so we don't want to put law enforcement in a position where every time they see a guy like swerve over the line, they got to like haul him back all the way into the office because yep. it's it's a blood test at this point in time. Uh, as Which doesn't make any to do sense. The THC. Or no, it's a urine test is what it is. Even still, doesn't make any sense. Exactly. It, it would be really embarrassing embarrassing to do urine tests on the side of the road. Um, Yeah. Right. So that that would be a problem. So we need to solve the law enforcement issues associated with it. Uh, But in the meantime, I think that, you know, and and I think that we'll eventually get there. Yeah. 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 I do too. I think it's inevitable. But I mean, we're really, I mean, we can't even get the decrim done and we're the only, I believe we're the only New England We are. Exactly. It's kind of embarrassing. It is a little embarrassing. (laughs) It is. It's, It's like we're Especially because so many people vote for it, vote, right. vote for yes, and it's been passed so many times. Right, but the House has getting... passed it ten times. Yeah, yeah and, exactly. but it just gets set. Yeah. I'm going to put this over here. So whatever we have to do, we have to think about the law enforcement aspects of it. That's the only issue. Right, absolutely. So, yeah. I guess we have a disadvantage of being the only, because uh, we're not a referendum state. The others We are not a referendum state. Are, right? I mean, I guess. Some, are they all? I, I think they may be in, in New England. I don't even know I, if it I would matter. I doubt that they got it passed on a referendum. I think they just passed oh, it yeah. in the House, so in their legislative body. Yeah, yeah. Personally, I don't think we should fully legalize. Really? No, I really don't. And no, I mean, are you okay with decrim? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't think you should have to, you know, a $420 fine, I think it's a perfect slap in the face. I think it's perfect because right. it's like, well, so we're not, not going to put it, it on your record. But don't but flaunt this you want to be a jerk about it. You want to be loud and be like, oh, I'm a stoner. Cool, mm-hmm. man. Like, 
Here's a four hundred twenty dollar fine. <laughs> it's a perfect slap in the face, and I love it. But the full legalization, the thing is, is that especially with where we've got this heroin epidemic thing yes. going on, we've got all these junkies in the state. We get a bunch of dispensaries Don't need to set encourage up. We that. get a bunch of stuff like that. They look at it as, well, we can just go and rob these places and then sell it to our friends for stupid cheap and da 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 da. da and it gives them another thing. And granted, this isn't happening with pharmacies. And, and we're stuff. and we're trying to get right. out of out of the that. crime business, aren't we? Yeah. yeah, exactly. But there's that. But then there's also less quality control. Full legalization allows for anybody and everybody to do whatever they want with it. Uh, as opposed to selling it through a state uh, organization. Exactly. You can do it like Colorado. I thought that that would be well, state Colorado as has... well. Isn't that full legalization if it's just the state selling it? Or that's not I think, full legalization? Well, no. I think, I think isn't Colorado you're allowed to grow as much as you want, wherever you want? I'm not or, sure. I'm not, I'm not exactly I mean, sure how they set it up. I don't know the up, answer to that either. No. My whole thing is I don't think it should be fully like free reign. I think okay. it should be if you're going to grow, you need a license. You need to be, if you're providing, if you're growing for your own personal use, you're growing a couple of plants in your, in your you know tomato garden or whatever, yeah. have fun. Whatever. Tomatoes will love it, right? But it right? should be the same as you catch a deer, you can't sell the meat. Right. You know what I mean? You can't yep. go and sell your vegetables on the side of the road, right. technically, and you sort of can. But well, we've got some, some low level. You should be able to. But we've but. got kind of decrim <laughs> levels in terms of exemptions, is yep. what you're talking about. You know, the so farm exactly. stand so or something like that. You need to have it be legit. If you're going yep. to sell to a dispensary, if you're going to sell to people, I mean, you need sure to have a stuff. business license. Yeah, you need to know that you're not getting stuff that's sprayed with miracle Grow that's going to give you cancer in two years. You know what I mean? Like, so. I'm all for regulation and some legalization, but as far as just have at it. So decrim. Yeah, okay. exactly. Well, there's also, too, though, I know that in Massachusetts, um, a lot of folks say that since they decrimmed, it's really kind it's of a de facto legalization anyway. Cops aren't bothering to write tickets. They don't want to bother with writing It's a, a bunch of paperwork for a fine. And Massachusetts, funny story, the $100 fine, nothing happens to you if you don't pay it. Oh, really? From about six years ago, I've got like three tickets. I went down to Hempfest one year. And, okay. I, and I just kept there just like, dude, you've been here twice. Stop. And I'm like, what do you, what do you I don't know where to go, man. This is my first time at Hempfest. You're, right. you're in the wrong part of the, so they actually ended up walking me over to the, the Hempfest. Police and we're like, this so, is where you so need you to stay. So you went to the protest against I went the Hempfest? To the, yeah, apparently. I was in some, <laughs> the wrong part of the park. And they're like, listen, man, you can't be smoking here. And I'm like. I'm sorry, dude. I don't know. And they're like, so he shows up at the police station. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, they, know, they had a little tent. They had a little tent, so they just walk you over and they'd give you the ticket and take your picture. And then the oh. second time I came through, they're like, "What are you doing back?" And I'm like, "I still can't find the thing, man." And they're like, "I was like, I just need to smoke," and that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, the main thing about that, oh, I lost my. my uh, you were no saying worries. nothing happens if you don't. Oh pay. yeah, so nothing happens to you in mass if you don't pay your ticket. No kidding. Absolutely nothing. Like I said, I've got three of them. It's been six years now. I haven't heard a word. They have my address. They have my phone number. What kind of car do you A Toyota? I think I saw a boot on a car <laughs> off the No, no, no. That's, no. It's, that's already at the house. And well, I do wonder, though, what, what happens if you get pulled over in mass? Well, and so from what I've heard from a couple of my friends that, that are experienced down there, that live down there, they're like, we've been pulled over hundreds of times. I've had more than an ounce in my car. I've had, you know, more... The thing is, if you're not being a but jerk But did they have an outstanding it, citation is your question, right? right? That's yeah. what I was If you're not being a yeah. jerk about it, Pretty much, they're kind of like, oh, okay, you guys smoking? Okay, no worries. Da -da 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 -da. You good? Like, how many fingers? How many fingers? Yeah. How many fingers? So they you do know? test you for impairment then. Okay. Pretty much, it's kind of like yeah. a, it's a laughable thing because they're like, are you good to drive? You know? Yeah. It's the same thing you say to your buddy when he's had one beer. Okay, you've had right. a beer, but right. are you good to drive? No, but I just wonder if you get pulled over in mass now with those citations on your record. I don't think anything. Uh, I don't think anything some comes of it. From what I've heard not. from my friends, at least. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, bunches of them I have. I mean, upwards of 10, 20 tickets, you know what I mean? Oh, but wow. unpaid from, or paid? But what, what's that? Un unpaid or paid, that's the unpaid. question. Yeah. Oh, unpaid. Oh, okay. No kidding. Yep. Wow. Interesting. Uh, from what I hear, it's been a huge issue where there's... Well, that, that may also contribute to and the, I'm wondering if the, the apathy as far as it the would be. Yeah, like why bother writing right? tickets? Well, they don't do anything about it anyways. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 So. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah. So. Do you have any any th you must have thoughts about the heroin epidemic and what we should be doing? Yeah, not only do I have thoughts, I think I have. Uh, you know, we need answers to this because this is a, it is a bit of a crisis here. I mean, my my first I get on this little soapbox that I'm a little bit upset in that I think legislatively we have a hand in the crisis that we're facing mm. because eight years ago we set up an addiction recovery fund. Uh, it was five percent of the uh, the alcohol funds revenue. Um, we systematically redirected $53 million of those funds out of that fund over the last eight years. Right, so you imagine today you meet a kid who's an addict and maybe if there had been an education 
you know, thing in, that we had paid for with that money that we redirected in his class, he would have figured out, oh, I'm not supposed to do this. So, right. you know, it's your classic, the government creates a problem and then like goes crazy <laughs> to try and solve the problem. Yep. Okay, I just have to get that out on the table because it just, it, it, it bothers me that yeah, we did that, yeah, you know. Um, yeah. You know, because that's the reason we set aside the addiction funding is right. so that well, we wouldn't opinion, get ourselves into this position. I think it's all coming position. in from Raymond. I really do. I don't There's know. There's <laughs> a lot of scary stuff going on in Raymond. People really? And their house is broken into people and, and being told, don't go to the cops because this is from the higher ups. You really? Uh, and stuff like that. You wouldn't expect that in a little town like that. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think wouldn't. so. Yeah. Well, but then again, I mean, think about the things that have happened out there. Right. I mean, we had that uh, murder for hire scheme out there. Mm -hmm. We had, I mean, there's been... Bunch bunch of things. Stuff that just but weird, the point is, though, like, if we're going to solve this problem, though, I mean, you know, government has a role, but it's not the the answer to the question. Yeah. It, it really has to be a community comes together because this exactly. stuff happens in a community. Mm -hmm. And if the community says, like, we're not having this here or we acknowledge that we have a problem and we're going to take care of it. I mean, I'm working with a group right now, the Addiction Recovery Coalition, and they are trying to set up homes in communities around the state for recovery because, you know, what happens is, you know, if a person is addicted, you know, the government is setting up these programs which are like, you know, 30, 60, 90 day kind of dry out things. That does not solve the problem. That just dries them out and then sends them back into the environment exactly. that ended up right. with them getting addicted. Right. You know, if you're going to get cured from this, it's got to be long term. Mm -hmm. It's got to be 24 seven and it's got to be kind of holistic because a lot of times these folks, they don't have vocational issues exactly. or they got family issues. They don't know how to get along with people, whatever it is. So, you know, we need to, I think at the community level, invest in like, look, these are our folks who are struggling and we're going to, you know, put them in a house and help, you know, be, be the community around them that says exactly. like, no, we're not going to let totally. you get engaged That's, in this uh, stuff. Ex junkie. Is it? Yeah. Clean. Oh, um, good for you. Yeah. Thanks. I mean, I luckily I caught it before the whole fentanyl craze came and right. you know, mm -hmm. I mean the stuff, it wasn't that scary So you can back speak then. better at the, on this well, than the I thing can. Is, but is that there's a lot of things they don't tell you about heroin. You know, there's very subtle things like, a, it'll find you on your worst day. And there's two types of people in this world. There's the people that will always be like, mm, no man, always said I won't. I'm just all good. And then there's right. the people that'll just have that effort in their system you know yeah right and they will they'll just be like screw it i'm well, doing it today yeah. all right i'll do it the once another thing they don't tell you is everybody and it does not matter who you are you everybody experiences the feeling of well it's not going to do it to me it's, i've done this i've done it a couple is, of times it's I've addictive done it. right it's absolutely it's addictive. Addictive. Yeah. And it, yeah. the thing is is that and i call her a she heroin is a she because she's a cruel mistress <laughs> she sticks five claws into you okay and until you've got five people in your place she won't let go. Right, with one claw. Right, exactly. So you exactly. need you need to you so need to be in that community. She'll, yeah. she'll get you to bleed into your friends, and they'll bleed into their friends, and they'll bleed into their friends. Yeah. And it's just, and a lot of it is to get out of it. You hit that point, and I'm sure a lot of people out there are feeling this right now. Is I'm done with this. I don't want to do this anymore. But my body is literally. He's I'm at the point. Like, I gotta you know, have it. Yeah, I go right. without it for two days, and my arm. It's not even like. Uh, oh, I'm sick and I'm going to throw up. It's a, My arm is literally jolting because it's craving the pain. Really? The, the, wow. the ritual yeah. of the needle going, everything. Oh, like, yeah. There's a whole mindset. Just like how stoners, you don't you, you break up the weed, you, you smoke, pack the bowl, you smoke the bowl. It's different than, say, doing a dab. A lot of people do these dabs now and they're like, I don't, it's, it's too weird because it's not the same ritual. Right. Mm. Same with a lot of people from the 60s. I like to roll joints. I don't understand bowls. We didn't have those back then. We rolled <laughs> joints, man. Like this is, and that's what I like that's to do. That's what we and, did, huh? And, yeah. and you'll talk to them and they'll be like, you know, I, I don't get high off a bowl because the ritual's not there. The, right. the calming, the, the same old, same old. See, so as a, as a society, <laughs> as a culture, we need to come around people and just like, that's the only way exactly. as a community we're going to solve this problem. Yeah. It's not, yeah. there's not a government program that we can implement that's going to solve not, it. A lot I think of it, it has is, a role, but it's not the old You really have solution. to change your whole life. You have to cut ties with everybody that, I mean, for me, I had to cut ties with probably over 700 people, you know? I wow, mean, that's it, a lot of people. Yeah, well, and I, is, granted, yeah. Yeah, retired drug dealer. I was a dealer for about six, okay. seven years. Um, yep. So I had a plethora a network, of people right. that were my yeah. friends. Right. But when I got into it, you know, I, you realize real quick when you're in a hard spot and you don't have anything for people, all of a sudden you realize who your friends are. But getting out of it, I had to cut ties with a lot of good, good friends. I yeah. managed to keep with actually the kid that actually got me into it and I are still friends. But we had to take a good three-year break. Cause, Is he clean? Oh, yeah. 
Good. Both of us are clean, have been. We'll you probably never have some go great back. stories. Oh, so I like, do. Yeah, honestly, so, so the answers to this solution, are, <coughs> these guys have it. Right. 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 Because, you know, you and I, if, I don't know if you've ever been an addict. I've never I, been I, an addict yet. My, I've never done ca cocaine. Caffeine. That's it. That's my only yeah, exactly. yeah. I do have that, right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Most, yeah. most Americans but do, do. But do you know what I'm saying? And there's like these guys who have come through that process, they're the ones who understand what is going to allow yeah. somebody to come out of that. And so what we have to do is really be listening to them. So, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Should, I mean, and I think we should start a community based thing where. You know, retired there are a bunch of community them. things getting going. The other yep. thing too yeah. is we got to break this cycle of or this notion that once a junkie, always a junkie. You yeah, know, there are a lot of people. I put the I pin down, and it's better. been five years since I've touched it. And okay. do I think about it? Yeah, sure. Sometimes I think about it. Sometimes yeah. on a really bad day, I'm like, yeah, it'd be nice to just you know get it in me and just everything washes away and I'm good now. But when I think about yeah. the actual feeling coming over me, I just think. But now, isn't that kind of like, that's as I understand? That's kind of like the AA thing. Is like you know, once you're an alcoholic, always an alcoholic, and you just and have see to. That, you know, it's that so that detrimental back. to people because it's is not it? true. It's not true. I did okay. ten years hard drugs. The only I can name the things I haven't done easier than the things I have: <laughs> okay. meth and crack. That's literally and PCP. <laughs> okay. Those are the three things I never. I was always like, eh, I'm gonna just that gonna, one's gonna screw me up. I'm right? gonna yeah. skip around this. Never expected to do heroin. Never expected to put coke in needles. It, right. But still. It found me, and, right. yeah. and I mean that was the scariest time of my life. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So I can't imagine crack meth or PCP. But a lot of it is, is that there's this this recurring thing of, well, you, once you're an addict, you're always an addict, and that, and in a sense, yes, you always have that. You just those moments like, if of I go weakness. Down, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Those moments of weakness. But the difference is, is that once you're once you're done being an addict, you look back on it and you're like, okay, I had my fun, and I I know what it is. But Here's another question. Here's a question for you. So I used to have a guy who worked for me who <coughs> had problems. Like he ended up in doing drugs and stuff like that. It was actually it was one of the sad things. You know, we succeeded. You know, this guy made a lot of money, and yeah. all of a sudden, then he was doing it right, and you felt bad for him. And he, you know, success. He he moved through that process, but he almost felt like he outgrew it. He's just like, he reached a certain age yeah. in his life. He's like, man, I can't do this I can't to my do body this anymore. anymore. Exactly. I'm too yeah. tired to do this. You, you know, know? I, mean? I mean, and granted, it was hard. I, I specifically went out of my way. My parents, I was raised, you know, my father wasn't around. It was told to me, oh, him, him and his whole family were drug addicts and drunks and da da da. If you ever touch a lick of any kind of drug or booze, yeah, you're so going to you be heard addicted. the message, don't go there. Yeah. Well, of course, I hit my rebellion age, and I was right. like, you know what? Not me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to find out. Well, and then I started finding out, no, okay, this is true. So I started finding, I started saying, you know, how many people go through this? How many yeah. people have yeah. this issue? I got to figure out a way to get through this. Yeah. So I went through, and just as things would come up, I'd be like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to just indulge myself, completely submerse myself in the drug, and once I'm literally, here's the bottom of the barrel, I fell through that floor, and then broke through that floor, and fell some more, you know? Luckily, A, you were able to come <coughs> out of it, and B, you're still alive to tell the story. Because that's Luckily, the, that yeah. is died the four crisis. Times. Died four Did times. Did you really? Okay. Twice on the table, Narcan? twice off. Uh, no, no Narcan, no nothing. Uh, the first two times in the hospital, uh, I, I very clearly remember hearing everything go quiet and start to muffle. And I realized really? I couldn't hear it's my over. heart. It's over. Yeah. And that's when I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I didn't want to go here. You need to do something about this. <laughs> this isn't how low. you go. Right. This isn't how you die. You die in a car accident. This isn't it. <laughs> yeah. And my heart started. And Wow. Wow. Yep. Okay. And, uh, yep. Defrib twice, defrib defrib twice and they, okay. uh, they gave up. And right as they were about to give up, my heart started back up wow yeah so so you're lucky to be alive absolutely the and, sad I, part and is i'm convinced that it's because i took this path i decided you know i don't want my kids growing up yep. being told by me having not done anything hey don't do this you know rah, 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 if i don't know well, yep. uh, i'd rather yeah, do you, we, we got a we got a call yeah hi welcome to rock paper hand grenades who's on the line hello hi matt yes Hey, uh, Peter and Joe called me the other day, uh, called them at their radio station, and I, of course, um, erased all my messages the other day, and I don't have their number, oh. and uh, <laughs> I was wondering, wait a minute, are you giving it to me? No, no. What, what number are you trying to get, uh, Mrs. X? The radio station. No. The radio? 5.3? No. I, I call the station for that. Yeah, you gotta... You know they're on the radio, right? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the number. I have no. You don't know their number. No. <laughs> but you're on live. Thanks for calling us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Mr. X. I don't. Yeah, that was a uh, wrong number. Yeah. yeah. Well, oh. no, I I know who that was because she calls the shows. But oh, okay. I'm not. I thought she uh, wanted to be on. Maybe had the assistance. Might have had uh, <laughs> the call numbers on the same contact. Yeah, I don't know. That was Possible. that was odd. 
Yeah. Anyway. Oh well. But anyway, so I'm glad. I'm glad that it worked out for you. There's Here's a, another a aspect. Road, Here's another dimension to this: is it not only affects the addict, but it affects their entire family. And that's it's and here's disrupted. the thing: is that you don't you don't notice that being an addict. You probably you don't, don't notice it, yeah, but you everybody around you notices. Notice okay? yeah. yeah. Funny story: so when the Molly came around, <clears throat> MDMA uh, and methadone, uh, methadone, all these different party drugs are coming around, and okay. flooding the city. I want to say it was uh, 2012, 2013. Okay. Uh, right before the heroin came in, and um, my brother was putting it in needles and whatnot, and da 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 da, da and I. It, the thing was, I wasn't scared that he wasn't doing it safely. I wasn't worried that he was going to OD. I, wasn't, I was worried that if anything did happen, the people he was around weren't going to do anything about it. You know what I mean? It wasn't that I was worried for him. Meaning like he could be harming people. He could, no, not even that. No, 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 no. He could end up doing – if he does OD, if he does anything happen, if you're, if you're sitting next to me and oh, you're and doing it, yeah. I'll take care of you. Okay. I know what to do. But his right. friends might have let him OD on the just floor. just as messed and just up like... as you, and they would be like – well, oh, sucks. <laughs> the type of people that would, like, this This happened, uh, what, six years ago now, Justine, as I can't remember her last name for the life of me right now, uh, wound up, she OD'd on heroin. Okay. And the people she was with, rather than bring her to a hospital, right, like, do you know, something for her, right? Drove her to her parents' house, dumped her on the steps, and left her. Oh, mm. wow. Yeah, that's sad. And I'm like, I can't, you're my little brother. You're not blood, but you look like me. That, you're my little brother. Yeah, exactly. I love right. you to death. If you die and somebody does that, I'm, gonna be I'm going to jail because right. I'm going to find out who left you on the stairs. You know right. what I mean? And that's what was the scariest so thing. Is totally affects the families and everybody around. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it's it's that fear of, I just don't know. I just don't know. Right. It's not that I'm, I'm worried that you're going to go out and have fun. That's not the fear. Yep. You know, it's the fear that if something does happen, no one's going to take care of you. Right. right. You know? Yeah. <clears throat> so, and when I, when I remember the day that that happened, that I was literally, I mean, this, the guy that he was picking up from was selling some stuff that was, uh, Tainted or something. It was. Like that. I saw the stuff and I Googled it. You know, yellowy, yellow, lemony, acidic flavored, clammy powder instantly pops up piperazines. This will kill you. Right? Yeah. It's it's sold yeah. all the time as Molly, and what it does is it shuts off your brain's natural ability to to regulate temperature. So you start heating oh, up, and wow. you think you're having a great time until your blood vessels start yeah. popping oh and you hemorrhage God. from wow. the inside out. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm telling him, do not sell this to my brother. Yeah. This is not, and he and he took it as, oh well, I'm gonna send people over there, blah, blah, blah all this crap. And I call my brother. And I'm like, dude, this shows don't, up, don't do go this. There. I'm telling you, I love you, yeah. and I'm not telling you don't go and buy another bag and go and have your fun. I get it. You're gonna do what you're gonna do, but this right. bag, do not this do. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And he wouldn't listen, and that's when it hit me. And I called my mom immediately, and then I'm like, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize this is what it was like, and she's like, "What are you talking about?" And I'm like, "The the the fear of just not knowing." Of losing, yeah, so of losing you realize what your mom was. And I was just like, "I'm so yeah. sorry. I put you through this for ten years. Like, yeah. I am so sorry. I I am so happy you haven't had an aneurysm or a heart attack. Like, yeah." And she was like, "I'm glad you finally understand." And I was yeah. like, "Never again." Right. So, and it, yeah. it really kind of nailed it home. Like, oh it is God. a lot scarier for the people because as an addict, you know, it wasn't scary for me. I almost died right. the other day, but guess what? I'm gonna go and do my thing again. You know, right. yeah. I'm gonna take a break, like, guys. I'm no, gonna take actually, a break. We do Two love you. Later. Right? We want you coming home. You know. Right. Yep. Uh, right. So. Wow. <clears throat> yeah, those are tough stories, aren't they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, as a parent yourself, obviously, you feel I'm well, sure vested in figuring I, this out. I do. I mean, so some of my kids are um, out of college, and they made it through. Well, I guess they're you know out I don't of know. College. Yeah. How old are you? Old enough. Wow. You know. But then I still have I have. Uh, <laughs> he looks he looks too young now. I still have, I have an eleven year old and I got a sixteen year old still at home. Huh. So, but again, you know the thing is, as a parent, you really want to try and you know impress on them the problem, but you don't want to do the in your face exactly. that you drive them to want to do something like that. Exactly, we're um, all going to hit that rebellious stage at some point. Oh yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. It is a phase that you know kids have to go through. Yep. Um, absolutely. You know, but you want to impress on them the danger of doing this. And, and it, you just, you see it in the schools. And, you know, honestly, I've, I've not had to encounter it. And I'm just like, how does it get into the high schools? Like, who's yeah. bringing this stuff well, in and getting it to these kids? Yeah. I mean, as, and I can tell you that too. So starting out, uh, ex-dealer, 14 years old. I smoked my first bowl of pot, or I think it was a bowl. Yeah, homemade little bowl, uh, like March 23rd or something. I think that it was right in that week. And so then the kids oh. just become the distributors? Within... Within three months, I had my own dealer, and within a month of me picking up from him and getting my friends all weed, he was like, you know, you should just come and work for me. And that's the thing is you get a lot of these yeah. guys where they're like, here's the deal. And you're making money. And, and, and it's, it's, yes, they're making money, and a lot of it is, and it's, it sounds really sinister and evil, but a lot of it is a lot of them are really good dudes, and they're kind of like, listen, here's the deal. I don't want to see you get ripped off. I don't want to see you get stuff that's laced with PCP, which yeah. has happened. It's happened to me once, and it was bad. 
You ever seen Training Day? Everything turns green. And yeah. It's like, yeah, yeah. Everything's just kind of rushing. I, I don't know where I went. I don't know how I got to Mount Inconunic from Bridge Street, but <laughs> I walked yeah. there. Yeah. And, uh... And I mean, and the thing is, is they'll come fast and they'll, at that point, right? Right. They'll, yeah. they'll come and they'll be like, "Listen, man, I don't want you to get ripped off. Let me hook you up with some good stuff. I mean, you know, let me give it to you at a better price. So you sell it to your friends. You make a little money. Da 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 da. Everything's cool. And then you know, you go and you're all excited because you're 14 and you're like, right. "Yeah, I'm gonna do I'm this. I'm gonna be a businessman man. now. It's either, this, so, or and then it's either of course, this or a paper route." <laughs> and for someone like me, yeah. you know, I have bipolar anxiety. I was a very socially awkward kid when I was younger. Once yeah, so I hit this... 13, 14, I started to even out because I started to smoke, and it really okay. kind of leveled the everything. You know, right. it just kind of leveled it out. Um, so, you so know, that's being, how it's getting sudden, in. Oh, yeah, so, so somebody all of a makes a contact the on the outside, and all of a sudden, it seems like this great thing. Or a lot of the times, and usually it's someone's older brother or da da da, and they got you know. A lot of it is you get seventeen, and eighteen and, year olds and, who and not figure out the, the game kids. of well, why am I paying for my weed when you all need weed? Right. I'm just gonna pick it up for my dude in bulk and sell it to you. Right. And you know, then I get to smoke for free. So, and then it just kind of goes it from snowballs there. Snowballs from there. A yeah. lot of the issue still is though. Tough. The big gateway drug isn't marijuana. I mean, yes, that's I guess it is technically because you you know you start there, but. Yeah. The bigger gateway drug is the pharmaceuticals, because yes. so many people so are kids on... ripping it off from their parents. Medicine no, not club? even. I mean, I w- I've been on med since I was three years old. I've been on probably at least twenty-five experimental medications that have never made it to things. And I'll tell you what: if you ever got your hands on some of those, you would not know. You would not know your name for three days. Really? I mean, I've woken up thinking I was Jack Sparrow from Pirates of the Caribbean. Wow. I woke up completely convinced that I was uh, Jerry from Tom and Jerry. So this is a good example. So that's a way <coughs> that the government can step in and can play a role we need in to regulating stop this stuff. Medication and we have been doing under some 12. things. If there's not severe reason for it, if yeah. you have autism, you have things like this. Severe. Like for me, it we, we need to, to control this process. Kind of, in other words, we need to know yeah. where they're going and how they're being used, and make sure they're exactly. not getting into. The, but also, to your just, point, just the due diligence you're getting of them, you're getting here's your pill. Let me watch you take it because it was you know go down and take your meds. Okay, well I'm not going to take this one because I can sell that Adderall. I'm not going to take this one because that's a sleeping this pill. This is what I'm saying. Somebody's we need to control. Somebody this wants something that's like better. a loot. You know, right. Yeah. So exactly. it's a matter of, and it's not yeah. just the government, it's also due diligence on the parents' part, I guess. Well, right. there's, there's so. been these stories, too, of, like, veterans who they can't get the pain meds they need from the VA anymore. Something goes wrong there, so they turn to whatever's available, and they right. end up... they end up Fentanyl and heroin are cheap yeah. alternatives yeah. to give you that, you know, if you're in pain and you need to do something, so... Yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that is. This is a really gnarly, tough problem. I yeah. think we can solve it. I think one of the things we want to be careful of is that we don't. It doesn't define who we are. You know how you were describing. In other words, like so, you don't have to be an addict. Exactly. You know, right? Just because you did drugs doesn't make you a lifetime addict. It doesn't define right. you as a person, and it right. doesn't define us as a state. You know, we are a state that has so many good things going, and so much potential, and you so can't many find things we can do. Half of the stuff that you can find here anywhere else. You know what I mean? Really? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's true. I mean, so what we need to do is we need to say, like, look, this is yeah. not who we are. And, and, like, let's not create an identity as with the opioid state, you know, or the heroin yeah. state. Because that's honestly, exactly. that is not who it's, we it's are. It's more harmful. It's more harmful, exactly. And, it, and it, honestly, it doesn't define who we are. You know, you yeah. have a it's kid who, is, who struggles in soccer. You don't know, like say something, you are, oh, you're dumb or you're this. Or, no, no. Maybe the kid's struggling with this. We've got to help them through it. But right. it doesn't become their identity. And I think we as a state need to make sure this doesn't become an identity for us. Exactly. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we only have a couple minutes left, uh, Frank. Any, any other big issues that you've been really kind of focused on while you're in the... Well, you've been in the state house. Yeah, so I mean, I, this last term, I focused on a lot of different things. I brought a lot of bills that I'm pretty happy about in terms of working on them. Yeah. Um, you know, some stuff in the family court system. Another, uh, you know, place that I think, you know, because the family systems are so messed up that this contributes to the opioid crisis. Right. Uh, and so there is a connect point there. Yeah. And uh, so I was able to bring a couple of bills that are through the house at this point in time, trying to you know, modernize our family court system. Really because all of the studies will tell you, you know, substantive time with both parents is good for kids. Right. And the kids yep. who are, you know, separated and, and every other weekend does not count as substantive time with the parents. No. Right. You know, yeah. and, and kids, you know, they grow up and they, you know, if you divorced at four years old for the kid and they got till 18, you know, stuff's gonna happen and they yeah. need different parents in their lives in different ways exactly. over that period of time. But when we, you know, right, you know, when we create these situations where the kids get isolated, oftentimes from dad, but sometimes with, from mom as well, um, it creates some of these problems that, that cause a gateway to 
maybe yeah. drugs or something like that. So that's two that I'm really proud of that Ed I having passed through the house at this point in time. That's good. We yeah. need to update those laws. We just did a whole custody battle with my kids, and the whole oh. thing was a mess. Because I'm working on it. I've heard it often. You know, it was so tough for ridiculous. me. One of the committees I sit on is child and family law. Now, I've been married for 30 years. You know, same person, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so I had no context for this, but I get into the child and family law committee, which is one of the three committees I sit on, and, I, and these people come in one after another. I just hear these repeat stories of how their lives have just been kind of torn apart through this process. And it's already a really hard situation. I think yeah. the judges are trying to maybe do the best they can, but uh, we need to work on that. Um, Absolutely. I yeah. mean, it was so traumatic for just the kids. You know, I mean, between Correct, the, exactly. the, the, in, the inconsistency and who's allowed and every, you know, the, and the, what are they the saying weird and tones everything else. of, well, who's a bad guy? Nobody's really a bad guy here. There's just We don't need to make bad guys. Exactly. Life's happened, and exactly. we're going to deal with it, guys. Exactly. 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 But yeah, it was so traumatic for the first two. Uh, my youngest, I, I, I'm afraid. You know what I mean? Because so, I'm like, I can't. I put my first time in two his at life is what will help. Four yeah. and five, put them back in the diapers. Yeah. And I'm like, eh. right because of the trauma of the process. So there's that. I did some work on some uh, <coughs> Second Amendment types of things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in terms of you know, we had our National Guard centers where uh, were un our armed service guys were unarmed. Yeah. So we, we I think we've got that. We're working on that and getting that one fixed. That Good. was a bill that we passed Good. out of the House. Good. Uh, did some stuff, you know, on, um, you know, energy in the state and particularly, yeah. uh, you know, jobs and energy to try and move some of that stuff forward. Um, we need to hop on that train. There's, yeah, it's yeah. a lot of good yeah. things. So, so number of different initiatives that I've been working on to try and help move the ball forward here. So excellent, and uh, of course, uh, you should uh, tell everyone how to spell your name so they can find you online. Yeah, so it's <laughs> E D E L B L U T, and the T is silent. And the T is silent. Yeah, hold that. Is it? Where to film? Can you hold that up to the camera and they can, can just see it that way? Yeah, there we go. You know, zoom yeah, in on that. Did yeah. they do that? Yeah. Or well, maybe we'll tag it or something like that. But you can find me yeah. on Facebook. You can find me on the internet, all yeah. over the place. And this will be up on YouTube tomorrow. Oh, well, okay, um, so wonderful. So when I when I get it up, I'll tag you on it too. So that sounds great. People will be able to find you. Well, thank you so much for having me come in. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. The that was a great discussion. I learned a lot of things. So. Yeah, Absolutely. the Honorable Frank Edelblue, and of course Johnny B. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, uh, and Gary, don't forget. Gary, yes. Thank you, Gary. Um, Gary, we hope you're, you're feeling welcome. better. <laughs> yeah, feel better, Gary. We'll see you next week. Bye, everybody.